This is the first talk where we'll kind of move into higher dimensions. Um, and I, I want to, in particular, uh, uh, talk about a specific way of trying to embed uh, contact manifolds. And this also gives a way of trying to embed topological manifolds as well. And I think there's actually a lot of very interesting, just purely topological questions you know, associated with this as well. Um, so we'll kind of get to those a, as we kind of go along. Um, but let me just kind of you know, get started here. <clears throat> so, so last time we, we saw that uh, um, just understanding embeddings of a contact S1 into a contact three manifold really led to huge advances in, in contact geometry in dimension three. Um, so that's one motivation for trying to understand contact submanifolds in higher dimensions. But just another one um, is, is probably much more immediate. Like uh, when people first learn about um, manifolds in general, um, it's a very abstract definition and it's kind of psychologically comforting to know, say, that all of your manifolds actually are submanifolds of Euclidean space. So basically, this is a prototypical example of, of, of uh, where you can, uh, where, where you have this embedding type theorem that says every manifold, no matter how complicated it might be, embeds as a submanifold of a, of a very simple space. So some, in general, you say Euclidean space. Again, I like compact things, so I'm going to say um, the sphere. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so, so again, this is another motivation why you might try to study contact embeddings is if you have, a com a, a, say, a complicated contact three manifold, is it a submanifold of some nice familiar space? Um, and let me just uh, remind you, just as we're going along, um, in, in the topological setting, um, uh, the, the, the strong Whitney theorem basically says you can embed an n-manifold in, in uh, R2n or S2n. Um, and uh, if you slightly weaken that and try to embed just in S2n plus 1, um, they said down here, this is called, usually called the weak Whit Whitney embedding theorem, which is probably what you prove in a, say, a first semester differential topology class. And it's actually relatively straightforward. You can do it with simple transversality type arguments. Um, but to actually prove that you can get into um, S2n is quite difficult. You have to actually have to introduce this kind of Whitney trick. And it's actually a little bit more involved than my bet is. Most people have never seen a complete proof of that. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's a really beautiful trick. And, um, uh, and if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to actually try to, try to see a proof of that or uh, maybe catch me at dinner with a beer or something and we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, anyway, so, so this is the prototypical example in, for, for, for topological manifolds. Um, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back. So, um, so we've, got, um, we've got an n-manifold embedded in a relatively simple space, but you might ask, could I do better? And by better, I mean maybe could I reduce the dimension further or make the topology simpler? Well, you don't get simpler topology in a sphere or Euclidean space. So the only way to really make this better is to reduce the dimension. And so it actually turns out you can do better in some cases. And in fact, for instance, it's known, um, it was a result of Hirsch and Wall, that um, every closed three manifold embeds in S5. So you can do one better than Whitney told you. Um, <clears throat> so you can do better. Well, as long as things are going good, you might hope for even better. So what about S5, S4? or R4, can you always embed a three manifold there? And well, it turns out that you can't. So for instance, if you look at lens spaces, there is actually a really, really fun exercise in, um, in, uh, in cohomology using cut products to prove that you can never embed um, LPQ for P bigger than or equal to two inside of S4 or R4 if you prefer. Um, uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite exercises to give people an algebraic topology course and get the cut products, but um, anyway. Um, and it turns out there's even more subtle obstructions. For instance, the Poincaré homology sphere, it has no homology or cohomology, so you can't use these kind of cohomological obstructions. But um, you actually can't embed it either because actually it has non-zero Rochlin invariant. And the Rochlin invariant of anything that embeds in, in uh, S4 or R4 actually has to be zero. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. I'm happy to tell you about it later. But um, it just gives you a different way of saying that something can't be embedded in um, R4. That's not all it does, but it's one of the things it does. Um, Great. Um, so, okay, so great. We know it can't be um, S4 or R4. Um, uh, one interesting little kind of side note, it's not going to be important for us because we only want to talk about smooth things, but I thought I'd just mention it. Um, while there are these obstructions like the Rochlin invariant for uh, smooth embeddings, um, by the way, I guess I never said that in these talks, but I'm assuming everything is smooth here. <laughs> um, but uh, 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 Michael Friedman in 1982, when he uh, did his kind of famous work on the classification of topological four manifolds, also proved that um, any topological um, homology three sphere, or topologically any homology three sphere does embed um, in, uh, in uh, uh, R4. So, uh, so at least topologically you can do it, but smoothly you can't necessarily do it. Um, <clears throat> So, 
as I said, you know, maybe you shouldn't be really stuck on you know, S5 or R5. You might say, OK, I'd be happy with some other four manifolds, maybe with simple topology. Can I do that? Um, and there's a really nice result from 91. Uh, uh, Xiaomi proved that um, there's absolutely no co compact four manifold in which all three manifolds embed. Now, of course, for any, th any fixed three manifold, there is some four manifold, right? Just cross the circle. And if you want a non-compact four manifold, we'll just take some infinite connected sum <laughs> Uh, all three manifolds cross circles, connect some, all of those, and okay, so for non-compact things you can, but that's kind of stupid. Um, but if you want one kind of simple manifold in dimension four, it just, it just won't happen. So really, this all says that S5 is the best you can do. Right? S5 is the absolute best you can do if you're interested in all three manifolds. Of course, some three manifolds will embed other places, but if you want all, S5 is it. Um, Anyway, I thought I'd uh, give you a little simple proof. Um, in modern language, at least uh, Hirsch's version for orientable manifolds is actually very, very simple um, if you know a little bit of handle body theory. Because um, it turns out that any three manifold is the boundary of a four manifold if there's zero handles and two handles. And you can always assume that the framings on the two handles are even. Um, uh, and then if you double the manifold, which we'll talk more about later, you wind up getting uh, just a connected sum of S2 cross S2s, which is the boundary of S2 cross D3s. And those clearly embed in S5. There's the proof. And, and believe it or not, this is actually, while well, I phrased it very, very differently, it's not infinitely far from what, um, from what Hirsch did. Um, Hirsch actually did, what he did is he actually took your three manifold, he had it bound a four manifold of a special type, basically exactly like this, and then he embedded the entire four manifold. So it sounds like it's a harder problem, right? Take your three manifold, make it a four manifold, and then try to embed the four manifold, but it just, it turns out that that's the way to, to make it work. Um, anyway, so that's the proof. Um, and again, this just kind of reiterates what I've already said. Um, the general question is, given a topological manifold, um, what can you embed it in? How simple a, a manifold can you embed it in? And by simple, I mean first dimension. How small a dimension can you, can you go? And then once you've minimized the dimension, what's the minimal topology? Like, of course, the sphere would be the best, but I'd be, you, know, you, you might be happy with you know, something like a product of spheres or some other relatively simple uh, manifold of that dimension. So, um, right. So that's the questions we're interested in. And so this was just a topological discu discussion, but remember, this is all about contact geometry here, so let's go to the contact geometry world. And actually, you have an analog of uh, Whitney's theorem for contact manifolds. So Gromov, in 1986, I put a question mark there because I actually don't know when he proved it. I think it might have been in his uh, thesis. Um, so he had a pretty good PhD thesis. Um, but he has a book called Partial Differential Relations, and this is actually where I know it was explicitly written. Um, I don't read Russian. If I did, maybe I could find it earlier. but. Um, but this is typically the date given for when he proved it. But he basically proved that any contact manifold could be embedded in uh, the standard contact structure on the sphere, which remember we defined this morning, um, in exactly the dimension predicted by the weak Whitney embedding theorem, which is the best you can do, right? Because you can't contact embed a contact manifold in an even dimensional manifold because that's not contact. So this is really the best you could do if you're trying to generalize Whitney's theorem. Um, and um, so uh, Gromov used a technique. Uh, he basically proved an H principle using uh, microflexible sheaves. Um, in some very strange sense, you might call this explicit, but I think most people, uh, if they look at the proof, they'd have no idea how this embedding actually happened. So luckily, um, uh, once we knew more about open book decompositions, which I'll say more about later, um, Atsuhiko Mori and um, Torres uh, managed to reprove this theorem using open book. So in some sense, it's a little bit more explicit way of, of seeing these embeddings. Not completely explicit, but a bit more explicit. Um, OK, good. So we've got started. Just like with Whitney, we know someplace they can embed. We know there's embeddings. But now can we do better? Like in particular, if you had a contact three manifold, this says you can embed in S7. Well, according to Whitney, at least topologically, the manifolds embed in S5. So what about in the contact uh, setting? Um, so anyway, here's the basic question. So, so which contact three manifolds do embed in S5 with the standard contact structure? Um, is there some contact five manifold in which all contact three manifolds embed? Um, uh, so those are the two main questions we're going to talk about now. But another very interesting question that kind of comes up out of all of this is what can you say about the isotopy problem? And what I mean by that is if you're given an embedding, a topological or a smooth embedding, can you actually isotope it so it's a contact embedding? And secondly, if you have two contact embeddings, are they isotopic through contact embeddings? We'll actually talk a lot more about this, actually, I think in the last talk. But for now, I just, you know, it's a natural question to mention, so I thought I'd just kind of you know, throw it out here. Okay? So these are the questions we're interested in. Let me try to say what I can say about these, these first two questions. I can't give you complete answers, but I can give you some partial answers. Um, so the first thing we see, um, so a little bit of bad news. At least I thought it was bad news, but I, that's, I'm trying to be optimistic here. But 
Um, it turns out there's an obstruction to embedding um, uh, contact manifolds. So Kasuya in uh, 2014 proved that um, if you have a, a co-dimension two embedding, right? So co-dimension two embedding such that the embedded manifold is trivial in homology and the first churn class of the big space is zero, then the first churn class of the smaller space, the embedded space, also has to be zero. Um, anyway, I have this little thing here to remind me so I don't kind of forget to, to, to tell the little story. It's actually a little kind of interesting because I, I can remember spending quite, quite a number of years trying to prove that <clears throat> contact three manifolds all embedded in contact S5, the standard contact S5. I spent many years trying to do it. I actually saw several preprints from other people that purported to do it. Um, I asked people like Eliasberg, all the experts in the field, you know, everybody thought, you know, it's probably true, but it's probably going to be hard to do. And look at, I mean, this, this is the entire proof of this theorem. Oh, by the way, maybe let me just, for, for those of you that maybe want a little bit of, a uh, little bit more explanation, uh, notice that if you have a three manifold in S5, since S5 has no three homology, um, it has to be null homologous. Since S5 has no two-dimensional cohomology, the first churn class is zero. Um, so that basically tells me that any, any um, contact three manifold, oh, another typo, it's supposed to be S5. Um, any contact three manifold that embeds in the standard S5 has to have trivial churn class. And there's tons and tons and tons of contact three manifolds that don't have trivial first churn class. So basically, there's an easy, easy obstruction to embedding uh, contact three manifolds, despite the fact that, again, many people have tried to prove uh, that you could embed for a long time, and many experts thought you could, and the proof that you can't is, is essentially trivial. Um, I mean, the proof is right here. But if you're null homologous, that actually means that you bound, um, you bound a four manifold that's embedded in your bigger, well, in this, sorry, you, you, you bound a two n dimensional manifold embedded in your ambient space, um, and that implies that the, the, the normal bundle of the manifold is trivial, but the normal bundle of the manifold in the big space is the same as the normal bundle of the contact submanifold in the in the bigger contact structure. Um, so you actually see that the, 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 the big contact structure is simply the smaller one, at least along the manifold M, is simply the, is simply the smaller contact structure direct sum a trivial complex factor. Um, and then just a, the simple formula for how uh, churn classes behave you know, tells you that the churn class of the bigger thing is the churn class of the smaller thing. I mean, so it's a super simple proof. And, um, uh, and, and this is a really good example, and I think there's many other examples of this uh, in, in mathematics, but this is one of, you know, at least for me, one, one of the most explicit examples I've seen. Um, uh, Yanki Lakili was visiting me for about a week, and we were trying to prove the theorem I'm going to tell you about uh, later on uh, today uh, in this talk. <clears throat> um, well, actually, really what we're trying to prove is that everything embedded in S5. And we kept getting close, we kept getting close, but we always would miss on a few examples. And we, all, we kept observing that those examples were examples with non-trivial churn class. And we thought, huh, that's strange. Maybe this is not true. Maybe the turn class is an obstruction. And within five minutes, we had this proof. Um, uh, Kasuya also had it at the same time and published it before we did, but, but so it's, it's really his result. But the point is, it's an example that as soon as you believe something might be true, if it is true, it might not be that hard to prove. Um, but as long as you don't believe, you know, no matter how easy the proof is, you're going to miss it, right? So um, anyway, uh, like I said, kind of interesting little story. Um, okay, good. So again, here's some examples. Uh, if you know what Legendrian surgery is, this is a Legendrian unknot. Um, and if you do Legendrian surgery, you get a Lin space with churn class non-zero. So again, it's just an example of something that doesn't embed. If you don't know what Legendrian surgery is, don't worry. It doesn't really matter. It just gives us this example. Um, uh, actually, I think we'll maybe say something about Legendrian surgery later on, but uh, for now, it's not so important. Um, okay, good. Um, so we have obstructions. So not everything embeds in... in um, oh, by the way, I said the standard contact structure, but of course any contact structure on S5 would have trivial churn class, so of course it's not going to embed there either. So no matter what contact structure you take, you'll never embed in S5 for everything. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, he gave us the bad news. Now the good news is, you might ask, what happens if the churn class does vanish? Oh, you know, everybody's been very polite and hasn't been asking me questions. Um, I keep saying churn class, right? But churn classes are about complex vector bundles, right? And we just said our hyperplanes are just you know, two n-dimensional bundles. Well, it turns out that the con if you take the contact form, the, the, the alpha, such that the kernel of alpha is your one form, d of it gives you a symplectic structure on the contact planes. And there's always kind of a naturally associated, well, at least up to deformation, uh, a complex structure associated with a symplectic structure. And we use that complex structure to define our churn classes. So all these churn classes I keep talking about come from, from that. Okay. 
Um, okay, good. Now that I've said something I should have said five minutes ago, let's, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, so he said, if your churn class vanishes on your three manifold, uh, your contact three manifold, then there is some contact structure on R5 uh, in which it embeds. So it's kind of almost a, you know, the best you could hope for, right? That if you vanishing churn class, if and only if it embeds. Um, a few remarks, you know, there, there's kind of two problems with this. One is that this contact structure C prime potentially depends on C. And secondly, I'm embedding in R5, not S5, not a compact manifold. And uh, if you look at the Kasuya's proof, that's very essential because what he did is he just took a trivial contact, the obvious contact structure on M cross D2, and he said you could extend it to an almost contact structure on the rest of uh, uh, R5. And then there's an old theorem of Gromov's, well, actually the same, in the same uh, textbook uh, that, that, that proves uh, that if you have an almost contact structure, which I'll say much more about later on, but I don't want to spend too much time right now, um, you can turn those into contact structures, um, but again, it might depend on C. Um, and also, Gromov's result only works for open manifolds, so you're really kind of stuck here. Um, but actually, there was an amazing development in late 2014. Uh, unfortunately for Kasuya, a couple uh, you know, months after he had his paper out, um, but uh, <clears throat> uh, Borman, Eliasberg, and Murphy introduced the idea of overtwisted contact structures in high dimensions. Um, now, the, con the, the definition is a little bit involved, so I don't want to give it here, um, but you should think of it as very much like the overtwisted contact structures in dimension three we talked about this morning. Um, uh, and um, the most important thing I want to mention is that uh, there is a unique overtwisted contact structure on S5, which is kind of amazing, right? Because on S3, there's actually an integer's worth, an infinite number. It turns out in other dimensions, there's more than one, but it happens in dimension five, there's a unique overtwisted contact structure on S5. And I mean, a really trivial extension of Kasuya, so I really hate to do this, but you know, my co-author is a graduate student, so I am gonna do it. Um, so, so Ryo Fuokawa and I uh, were able to prove, again, a very slight extension of Kasuya's result, once you know this, this overtwistedness, that basically a contact three manifold embeds in S5 with the overtwisted structure if and only if, um, if and only if C1 is zero. So it's, it's exactly what you would hope for, except you might prefer to have the standard structure there, right? In fact, that's what I have, I think, on the next slide is, um, you would like a similar result, but for a nicer contact structure. This overtwisted contact structure is a little bit complicated. It's not as easy to understand as, as the standard one. Um, and as we mentioned this morning, the overtwisted contact structures are very much related to kind of the algebraic topology of the, the manifold homotopy theory, um, where non-overtwisted ones are hopefully a little bit more geometrically or, you know, have a little bit more geometric flavor. And so you'd really hope that maybe you could do it for the standard one or maybe a fillable contact structure or something with a nice property. Um, and also you might wonder, what can you say about uh, 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 embeddings of contact manifolds whose first turn class is not zero? And um, we're gonna talk uh, about question one quite a bit in the first talk tomorrow. But for today, I wanna talk about uh, question two. So we know you can't embed all contact three manifolds in, uh, in S4, S5, but maybe there's some other contact five manifold in which you can embed them. Um, so for instance, what's the next, topologically, what's the next simplest thing after S5? Well, I think most people would probably guess just product of spheres. Um, that's topologically the simplest next thing. Um, and you can use the, the Kasuya obstruction, more or less, a sl well, maybe a slight extension of it, to show that you cannot embed contact three manifolds in uh, S1 cross S4. Hopefully that's obvious, right? Because again, no three homology, so any embedding is null homologous. And uh, no two-dimensional cohomology, so the turn class is zero, so you have the exact same obstruction, right? Um, a little bit more work you have to use, but you can actually show that you can't embed in any contact structure on S2 cross S3, except possibly one with first turn class equal plus or minus two. Um, again, you have to work a little bit harder at that, but, um, and again, if you're interested, I can tell you why, but for now, let me just make that statement. Um, and actually, I, I, I call it a 90%, or a six, I didn't, uh, Maybe I'm overly optimistic now. I said 90, but it says 60. Publicly being recorded, it says 60. 60% 60 theorem. And what I mean by that is we have the outline of the argument. I'm pretty sure it completely works, but I haven't kind of crossed every T and dotted every I, so I don't want to claim it as a theorem, especially on something that's going to go on the web. So, uh, so uh, let me just say it's a 60% theorem um, that basically there is an overtwisted contact structure on S2 cross S3. In fact, it's unique up to homotopy. Um, uh, into which all contact three manifolds embed. So, um, so hopefully I can turn that into a 100% theorem soon, but um, didn't quite have time for it before this talk. Um, but anyway, again, it's an overtwisted structure, so you might hope for something a little bit nicer. 
Right? You might hope for something nicer. Um, again, something tight or fill tight, meaning not over twisted, or maybe symplectically fillable in some way might be nice. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, can you do that? And and actually, right now, I don't know. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. I actually have a, an idea about how you might be able to do it, but I, that's you know so far from actually being done. I wouldn't even call it a one percent theorem at this point. It's a it's a half baked idea. So, um, okay. The fiber connected sum of the overtwisted S3. Um, what's the turn class of that? I would have guessed zero, but then, then I no. It has to have a first turn class either plus or minus two. So, so I, don't, I don't think that's the one, yeah. But we can talk more about it later, but yeah, I don't think so. Um, okay, great. Um, so what can we show? So we can't, we can't quite prove this yet, but basically the rest of this talk, I'd like to outline the ideas to proving uh, the following theorem that's joint work with uh, Yankee uh, Lakili. That um, basically there is a Stein fillable contact structure on the twisted S3 bundle over S2. Once you're done with spheres, what's the next easiest thing after a sphere? Is twisted sphere bundles, right? So if you just take, there's a unique twisted S3 bundle over S2, and we say there is a Stein fillable contact structure um, into which all contact three manifolds embed. So I'll sketch the proof of that for the rest of the time. Um, the proof is relatively simple, but the idea, the ideas that go into it, I think are quite interesting, and that's why I wanted to spend some time on it. And what they do is they, general, they generalize the idea of a spun knot in dimension four. So anybody that studied a lot of knot theory and maybe tried to do something outside of dimension three has probably come across this construction, which I'm not sure, but I think might have first been done by Zeeman. Um, actually, do you know Heim or Yoav? Yeah, maybe Zeeman. We'll say that. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so the idea is if you have uh, you have a knot in, in R3, which you kind of isotop it so that it kind of sits in the positive x, most of it's in the positive x direction, and you cut out a little arc of it. So you've just got an arc kind of knotted up here in kind of half space, in three-dimensional half space. Well, uh, then you can actually have an embedding of, uh, of uh, 0, 1 cross S1 into R4 just by using this formula. So you basically just think about spinning the x-axis kind of in the xw plane. Um, and that, that gives you an embedding of this annulus, but this annulus, the uh, zero cross S1 all goes to a single point. So actually this gives an embedding of an S2. So you start with this, you start with a circle, you cut out an arc, and then you get an embedding of an S2 into, into, um, into four space. And this is a great way to build very interesting knots in, in, dimension, uh, in dimension four from knots in dimension three. Um, and this has been much studied by, uh, by uh, topologists for, uh, at least 40, 45 years. Um, and what I'd like to do is to kind of talk about a generalization of this construction and then how to use that generalization to prove this theorem. So um, before I do that, though, um, I need to actually go back and talk about open book decompositions again, except this time not just in dimension three, and I'm going to give a different perspective on open books. Last time we talked about open books in terms of a knot and a vibration of the complement, now I want to talk about them in, in a different perspective. So let me start the definition here. So suppose we're given a pair, of, uh, a pair here. Um, the first thing, um, which I'm going to call the page, is just simply an n minus 1 manifold. Okay? And the second thing is a diffeomorphism of that n minus 1 manifold that's the identity near the boundary. Right? So there's an obvious construction you can do called the mapping torus construction, which basically means take your manifold cross interval and glue kind of the front to the back using your diffeomorphism. Okay, so it's kind of some twisted kind of gluing thing. And notice, if you look at the boundary of this, because phi is the identity near the boundary, um, the boundary of this mapping torus is simply the boundary of x cross s1, right? Um, and therefore, um, you can actually glue the boundary of x cross d2 to the mapping cylinder to get a closed n manifold. So I'm going to denote this manifold uh, m sub x phi, and this is a closed n manifold that I constructed from this n minus 1 manifold in this diffeomorphism. Well, we say that x phi is an open book decomposition, which I guess I left out decomposition, but anyway, an open book for a manifold M if M is diffeomorphic to this thing I just constructed. Okay. By the way, I, I've never quite liked this definition. This is the way people normally give it, um, just because notice we've actually hidden some information here that's very important, that diffeomorphism between M 
and the thing I constructed on the last page. Um, and that actually provides a little bit amb of ambiguity in the definition of open book. That's why the one I gave you uh, in the first talk was kind of a little bit better definition. But anyway, this is a standard thing to do, and so that is what I'm going to do. Um, and I like to observe a few things. Notice that if you look at uh, boundary of x cross 0 in boundary of x cross d2, that thing we glued in, you know, that's a co-dimension 2 submanifold in m x phi. And, um, and if you look at its complement, you just got um, the interior of the mapping cylinder. And the, map, the interior of the mapping cylinder clearly fibers over the circle. Why is that? Well, I mean, notice this thing, x cross 0, 1, has a projection onto 0, 1. And when I do this gluing and I glue 0, x, uh, 0 1, the endpoints of 0, 1, I get a circle. And so you basically have a fibration just by this, the, the projection map here uh, from this to 0, 1 descends to a fibration of the mapping cylinder over uh, S1. So we have what we talked about this morning, basically a co-dimension 2 submanifold and a fibration of its complement. Um, so we also, some people also call this, this B pi an open book for M as well. Um, and actually, I much prefer this definition. It's, it, it, it carries more information than this definition. But for this talk, it turns out that it's going to be better to work with this x phi instead of the b pi. But you should think of them as almost interchangeable. Um, OK. Any questions about open books? Good. All right, great. Well, let me give you a few examples. Um, so the first example is if you have any sphere, say, of dimension n plus 1, uh, you can think of, it as, uh, of the join of uh, an n minus 1 sphere and a 1 sphere. If you don't know what the join is, I've given you the definition of it right here. A join is simply you take the product of the two spaces and the product with an interval, and then at 0, you collapse one of the spheres, and at the other point, at 1, you collapse the other sphere. So here's an example. If you took the picture really as S1 cross S1, where if you identify the top to the bottom and the front to the back, the picture is S1 cross S1 cross interval. And I've, cr I've collapsed uh, one of the S1 factors here and the other S1 factor here. And uh, it's very easy to convince yourself this is, this is the, uh, well, the picture is of the three sphere. But in general, if that's an Sn minus 1, this is an n plus 1 sphere. Um, but from this description, notice on one half, you have Sn minus 1 cross D2. And on the other half, you have Dn cross S1. So basically, uh, this is a mapping cylinder of the identity map from dn to dn, and this is basically the boundary of dn cross d2. So this is exactly an open book decomposition for Sn minus 1 with binding uh, d, uh, sorry, uh, Sn minus 1. Okay? So it's a very nice explicit example. Um, and of course, also the pages are dn. Um, let me uh, give you one more uh, example that's actually going to be very useful for us. So suppose you take any manifold x and you consider the open book decomposition x comma identity map. So you just glue by the identity in the whole process. What do you get? Well, I claim the first thing you get is this picture right here. This upper blue portion is just x cross minus cross 1 half to 1. The bottom portion is x cross 0 to 1 half. And of course, you've gl glued x cross 1 half to x cross 1 half up there, and then x cross 1 to x cross 0 there. Um, just by the identity map in both places. And then in the middle here, you've got boundary of x cross d2, this red portion. Um, topologically, it's easy to kind of collapse the d2 here to, to some interval, so it looks like this. And uh, you actually get topologically the same manifold. And you can actually easily convince yourself smoothly it's the same manifold as well if you're careful about the collapse. Um, but from this description here, you basically see that you've got you know, x cross uh, some interval, union x cross some interval, where you've kind of glued along the boundary. Um, well, when you take a manifold and you take the same manifold and you glue them together along the boundary by the identity map, that's actually a, a well-known construction called the double of the manifold. So basically, if you, take, uh, if you take a manifold and you look at the open book with that manifold comma identity, you basically get just the manifold, the double of the manifold cross interval. Okay. OK, so if you didn't follow the whole thing, that's fine. The important thing to realize is that if you just take uh, manifold cross interval and double it, you get uh, th that, that's what you get from the, uh, from the open book construction with the identity monodromy. Okay. And a specific example is, for instance, suppose x is just S2 cross D2. That's a nice four manifold. Um, and if you take x cross interval, that's basically just S2 cross D3. And when you double it, you get S2 cross S3. Um, well, let's look at other D2 bundles over S2. It turns out there's an integer's worth of them. Here's a Kirby picture of them, if you know what that is. If you don't, don't worry. Um, there's an integer's worth of these things. 
Um, and if you cross with 0, 1, you get D3 bundles over S2. It turns out there's only two of those. So if n is even, you get S2 cross D3. If n is odd, you get a twisted D3 bundle over uh, S2. And now if you double those, well, the S2 cross D3 gives you an S2 cross S3, and the twisted thing gives you a twisted S3 bundle over S2. So basically, by just doubling these, these, these nice disk bundles, you, you get these, uh, uh, well, cross interval, you get the open books for, uh, for these manifolds. All right, so this is just a topological construction that we're going to be using as we go along. But it's a very nice way of uh, decomposing a manifold into pieces. Um, and I guess I should mention also, if you want to use open book decompositions to study contact structures, those are, those are, those are, uh, they live on odd dimensional manifolds. So you might ask, do odd dimensional manifolds always have open book decompositions? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes because of all of these people. There's a long history. Basically, people are interested in open book decompositions because they're interested in foliations on manifolds. And they could use, at least sometimes, they could use open book decompositions to build interesting foliations. Um, uh, so uh, the, first, uh, the first result along these lines was by Tamura and Winkelkamper, and they proved this theorem in dimensions uh, 6 and above, I think. Um, well, for us, I guess 7 and above, um, uh, with extra hypothesis. I think it had to be simply connected, and I think they might have had a few other hypotheses as well. Um, uh, then uh, Lawson proved this exactly. Uh, this exact statement in dimension 7 and above. Then a, comp a compo for the simply connected case uh, did the five manifolds. Quinn did the entire general situation. And um, I should mention for n equals 1, it was proved by Alexander in 1920, so a long, long time ago. Um, so uh, if you're interested in even dimensional manifolds, which of course, why would we be? We're interested in contact manifolds. But if you're interested in even dimensional manifolds, you could ask about open books there. And it turns out that not every even dimensional manifold has an open book. But it's completely understandable when they do and when they don't. Basically, Quinn answered that question, too. So you just you completely understand. Um, but again, for us, it's not going to be so important. All right, good. So I can finally get to the main construction of the paper, and that's spun embeddings, which generalize the idea of spun knots. So this lemma is essentially the, the idea of spun embeddings. So suppose you have two open books, <clears throat> so x phi and uh, y psi. Um, and suppose you have an embedding, a, a, a one parameter family of embeddings of y into x, okay, that satisfy the, pro the following thing. So the embeddings are proper, and what I mean by that is they send the boundary of y to the boundary of x. That's all I mean by that. Um, and the interior to the interior. Um, also, um, ft needs to be independent of t near the boundary of y. Um, and finally, uh, the monodromies have to be conjugated by the diffeomorphism. So if you do these compositions, you get the same thing. Right? Well, if you have all of this, then I claim it's very easy to see that there's an embedding of the manifold whose open book is, comes from y into the manifold whose open book comes from x. Okay? And I mean, the proof is essentially trivial because you can embed the mapping cylinders by 1 and 3, um, 1 uh, being, well, Actually, sorry, you really only need three <laughs> to embed the mapping cylinders. But then one and two can be uh, used to extend uh, the embedding of the mapping cylinders over the binding. Um, so it's a, it's a really, really simple construction. There's really not a lot to it. Um, but for some reason, it's, it really hasn't been studied very much. Um, kind of uh, in an ad hoc way, Mori has actually used these quite a bit, um, but never really talked about them in general and general dimensions and tried to study them systematically. But I think these are really interesting ways of, of building uh, embeddings of one manifold into another. Um, so just an example of this, I claim that the spun knot idea is precisely this, uh, what comes from that lemma. So for instance, if I have my knot k, um, and I just have a little ball here, and I remove that ball, then I have k, I can think of it as a submanifold of S3 minus the ball. So that's going to be my page. y is simply going to be this arc that's outside of the ball. And my embedding is just the inclusion map. And then if you follow uh, what happened in this lemma, what you built here, you built precisely that spun knot I showed you on the first picture that I gave you an explicit formula for. But here you get it in terms of the open book. And there's actually been all sorts of generalizations of spun knots when people studied four, you know, knot theory in four, dimensional, in four dimensions, um, like spun knots. And uh, there's, I don't know, there's a half dozen other adjectives you could put in, the, in front of the word um, uh, 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 sorry, twist spun knots and, and other so, sort of things. And those actually come from, from the same construction, except instead of letting f just be the inclusion, you actually do some non-trivial symmetry to the knot, you know, keeping the endpoints fixed. And that gives you some sort of twisting of the spinning construction. 
And um, again, that's actually been extensively studied um, in the past as well. Um, but anyway, that's essentially that's the only thing that topologically has been extensively studied. So I think it's, it's very interesting to ask, I mean, can you prove uh, that any closed three manifold embeds an S5 using the spinning construction? Um, so basically take an open book for your three manifold and an open book for S5, can you embed one into the other using these open books? Um, at the moment, I don't know if that's true or not. I think it's true. Um, and I think I have an idea how to prove it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but it'd be nice because it would give a completely different proof of, the, of Wall's theorem um, using these kind of spun embeddings. Maybe even a better question is, if you a priori give me an embedding, can you isotop it so that it looks like a spun embedding? That's a much harder question. I have no idea about that one, but I think it's a really interesting question. So basically, how versatile, how general is this construction? Um, oh, actually. I know the answer to that question, it's no. I, in dimension four, I know there's embeddings of S2 into, into S4 that don't come from the spinning construction. So I guess you can't get everything, but it might be interesting to understand what you can get and what you can't. Um, anyway, so where does contact geometry come into all of this? Well, just like I told you about Giroux's theorem uh, um, in the first talk, uh, that to an open book in dimension, um, in dimension uh, three, you can get a contact structure. There's a similar theorem, although it's a lot more complicated to state. I don't know if we want to go through all the details of the statement. Um, yeah, maybe for the sake of time, I won't. But basically, if you're given an open book in high dimensions, such that the pages have a, a one form, d of which is a symplectic form on the pages, so in other words, it's non a non-degenerate two form, and you have this vector field condition, and the monodromy preserves d of the one form, then you get a contact structure. So you have all these conditions. Again, at, for our purposes uh, in this talk, it's not so important we go through all the details, but basically, given an open book and this extra condition of B with some conditions, you can build a contact structure um, on your manifold. Um, uh, so for instance, uh, um, these disk bundles EN, it turns out they have lots of different um, uh, of these betas on them um, coming from these surgery descriptions. And um, it's interesting to kind of a little interesting exercise to show that the contact structures you get from that previous theorem when P and Q vary actually are different. Um, so again, it's, a, it's, it's not too hard to show that. It's just basically kind of a, a compute some churn classes, really. Um, but anyway, so here's a few explicit examples of, of things uh, that you can build. Uh, so explicit contact structures you can build on. Um, and remember what these manifolds are. Um, oh, I, I didn't write. Oh, yeah. So on S2 cross S3 or the twisted uh, S2 cross S3 bundle, depending on whether n is uh, even or odd, right? Okay, good. So we have our open books. We have the idea of a spun embedding, and we have a way to associate contact structures to, uh, to open books. Um, so I now need one more tool, and we can finally prove, uh, we can finally prove uh, the main theorem. So the tool is basically a way to build these, n these nice, kind of exact symplectic structures, so these betas, on four manifolds. And one of the easiest ways to do them is actually to realize your four manifold is a Lefschetz vibration if you can. So let me remind you what a Lefschetz vibration is. So um, a four manifold, uh, a Lefschetz vibration on a four manifold, um, I think I already said at the, in the first talk, but let me remind you, anytime you can put the word oriented in front of something and make sense out of it, do it. So this is an oriented four manifold. So given an oriented four manifold, um, a Lefschetz vibration is simply a map to D2 such that all the critical points lie on the interior of the four manifold, and at any critical point, you have a local model. Basically, there's a chart for X that looks like C2, a chart for D2 that looks like C, such that your map in your coordinates looks like Z1, Z2 goes to the product of Z1 and Z2. So you basically have this very simple thing. By the way, you should think of this as a, as a complex analog of like uh, uh, the Morse theorem, that basically is kind of like a complex Morse function in some sense. Um, anyway, let me just observe a couple of things. Suppose you take a point that's not a critical point of D2, or a critical, oh, again, another typo, not a critical value <laughs> of F, then the inverse image is just some surface of genus G, and as you move from point to point, it turns out those surfaces all have to be the same. In particular, if you remove all of the critical points, then um, you restrict F to the complement of the fibers above those critical points, you're going to get a surface bundle over D with all those points taken out. Um, so that's the first couple things to observe. Moving on, what happens at the critical points? Well, at the critical points, you see exactly this picture, although I've, of course, cut the dimensions in half 
Uh, and again, typos, that's a C2 going to C. Um, so it turns out that if you're not at zero, that, X, that green X is zero, um, then what you wind up getting in your local coordinate chart here is just an annulus, an S1 cross R. And at zero, you just get the coordinate axes, so C cross C intersecting at a single point. Um, and uh, notice uh, that the, the S1 that's in the middle of this S1 cross R, um, as the point Y goes to X, kind of collapses to that point P. So more globally, this is what you see. Your generic fiber here, your generic fiber is just some surface with boundary, and you've got this circle, this blue circle, uh, sorry, this red circle up here, I'm drawing it here, and as Y moves to X, that circle kind of collapses to a point. And the circle is frequently called a vanishing cycle because actually if you think about what happens to the homology of the surface, that, that, that curve in homology dies as you move into your critical point. Okay? Um, so that's what happens near the critical points. Um, another thing that's uh, not too hard to see is that, um, uh, so if you look at a disk, which I just gave a different name since uh, I just want to look at one kind of critical point. If you look at a disk around the critical point, so there's no other critical values in here, um, and if you look at the boundary, if you look at the inverse image of the boundary of that disk, you're going to wind up getting a surface bundle over the circle, right? Because every point above, uh, 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 everything above a point in the circle is just a surface, um, and as you move around, you know, you just fill it up with, 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 these, with these fibers. Um, and it turns out that it's going to be a trivial bundle away from the vanishing cycle. And at the vanishing cycle, you can just do a little local computation to see that what happens is you get a Dane twist. So basically, the surface bundle over the circle is essentially described as the mapping cylinder of a Dane twist about the vanishing cycle. Okay. All right, good. Um, and finally, if you have a bunch of critical points, connect them all to a single point X, then along those arcs, you can use to define a bunch of vanishing cycles in the fiber above X, and it turns out the monodromy of the surface bundle over circle you get going around D is simply the composition of all the Dane twists about all the vanishing cycles. Okay. Okay, good. I think that's what we need. So now here's a lemma that you can prove. Uh, one of the things we need to prove our main theorem, and that's if you have a left Schutz vibration of a four manifold over a disk uh, with vanishing cycles C1 through Cn. Um, and you have a contact three manifold that's supported by an open book whose monodromy is a composition of Dane twists about those vanishing cycles, then you can embed your three manifold, your contact three manifold, into the contact five manifold you get from the open book X comma identity. Okay. So this is a specific, a very explicit kind of uh, contact embedding theorem, but the manifold here, of course, uh, depends on X, right? And yeah, depends on X. Um, so that's one lemma. Second lemma is, uh, again, with Yonke, uh, that if you uh, look at a surface of any genus with one boundary component like this, you look at this chain of, uh, of uh, circles, uh, along with this one extra one kind of hanging off here, um, there's a left shift vibration over the disk with vanishing cycles, exactly those circles, such that, the, such that X is just a D2 bundle over S3 with uh, Euler number minus 3. And in fact, it has a particular Stein structure on it, a particular uh, one form, uh, uh, like, as in the uh, Giroux's theorem to construct contact structures. So with these two lemmas, we can easily prove our main theorem that uh, every contact three manifold embeds in this twisted S3, S3 uh, bundle over S2. Um, so basically, suppose you're given um, a contact three manifold. Let uh, take an open book uh, for that contact structure, um, such that the binding is connected. Um, the curves in lemma two are actually a generating set for the entire mapping class group of, uh, of that surface. Um, they're called the Humphreys generators. Um, so we actually know that phi is a composition of Dane twists about those vanishing cycles, and so lemma one says it embeds. And uh, uh, since, since the, the manifold we get here, uh, since, this, uh, since this thing is the same, no matter what surface we use up here, um, that basically says the thing you're embedding is, is the same. Um, and by the way, what did we say? We actually said that if you're, you have a, 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 a disk bundle over S2 with Euler uh, number minus 3, then uh, that we know that, uh, that the associated uh, manifold is the twisted S3, bun uh, uh, S3 bundle over S2. Right? Okay, good. So that's the proof of the theorem. Um, 
I should mention, um, actually, do I have time? So I've got uh, five minutes. Well, I still have a few more slides. But uh, yeah, let me just say very quickly, um, you, you, there, there's actually partial results in other settings. Like, for instance, if you have a, um, a contact three manifold whose open book, uh, the monodromy of this open book uses only the, only the curves uh, C1 up to C2G, uh, but not this last one. That's usually called a hyperelliptic uh, element of the mapping class group. But if you have one of those, then we actually can embed an S5. Because it turns out that this lemma, if you get rid of that last curve, it turns out that what you wind up building is S5. You get an open book for S5. Um, if you can use all of these curves except that last one, but instead use the curve that's one over, then you can embed in S2 cross S3, because I'll get an open book for that. Um, if, oops, if you can, um, if you have a three manifold whose open book uh, is a concentration of Dane twist about all these curves except C1, uh, you can also embed in S5. So there's all kind of you know, conditions on the monodromy for your contact three manifold that will guarantee you can embed in either S5 or S2 cross S3 with a Stein fillable contact structure. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a completely general theorem that we can always do such a thing, at least not in the S2 cross S3. Um, anyway, so, so there are some partial results uh, of a more general nature. Um, so let me just prove the theorems really quick. Uh, again, if you know these, uh, the techniques here, great. If not, don't worry. I'm going to just go through it quickly. Um, but to prove lemma two, remember lemma two is the fact that, uh, that this left uh, uh, vibration um, is the, D, uh, the, the, the uh, D2 bundle over S2 with uh, Euler number minus three. And the proof is very simple. There's a picture, a Kirby picture of the, uh, of the open book. You can cancel out all of the, so notice like that one handle, the A one handle and that curve, they just cancel out. That just cancels out, that just cancels out. So you actually get down to this picture just by canceling one handles and two handles. Um, and then when you cancel this one handle and this two handle, this one handle, this two handle, you just get a single two handle with a framing minus three. So that's it. And also you can see as you increase the genus, you never touch kind of this region here. So the Legendre you have here that actually builds your Stein structure is always the same no matter how big the genus gets. That's actually very important if you want to say you're always embedding in the same contact structure. But, um, but that is the case. Um, and then for the proof of lemma one, which I'll end with very quickly here, is simply this. So if you, have, um, if you have a curve that goes around a single singularity in a Lefschetz vibration, then notice, um, uh, so I've got the curve here, gamma, then notice I can construct a manifold M, which is simply just the points above gamma. And as I said before, that is simply the uh, circle bundle, uh, uh, sorry, the surface bundle over a circle with monodromy, um, with monodromy the, the Dane twist about, about that curve. But notice, I'm going counterclockwise. I'm using the complex orientation. If you, if you use the opposite orientation, go around the other way, you actually get the inverse Dane twist. Therefore, if you give me any monodromy that's a composition of Dane twists about the vanishing cycles, I can find some curve that runs around in a crazy way. It's immersed, but it's some curve that runs around in a crazy way, such that, I'm, that I actually pick up all of the Dane twists about the curves in the right order. And now, when you kind of suspend that in the mapping cylinder, you actually get an embedding because you kind of pulled apart the point. You don't have these immersed points anymore when you kind of you look at the trace of it with the S1 factor. So you end up getting an embedding of the mapping cylinder of phi into the mapping cylinder, well, into X cross S1. And now you've got some conditions, some, some worry about what happens at the boundary. And that's actually a pain, but you, you can actually fix up what's going on at the boundary too to get a spun embedding as well. And that's actually how you embed, embed everything. So I'll quit there. Thank you. <laughs>